Hello, um, my name is Pat Doyle and I'll be teaching the physics course uh, for you. Um, now, first of all, today it's a, the class for what we call day one and it's section A and we're going to be looking at the material from mechanics one, concentrating quite a lot actually on, say, Newton's laws. Okay. Now, first and foremost, if you have your notes handy, if you turn to what would be, be, be uh, page 20 in the actual notes, and um, what you'll actually find there, okay, is on the page 20, I have a statement there, first of all, of Newton's first law. Um, if you flick over there very quickly onto what would be the page 21, you see a statement of Newton's second law. And of course, Newton's third law follows on on the next kind of sheet of paper there. If you kind of turn over the page one little bit there, you'll actually see on the page 24 there, we actually have Newton's third law. Now, the first thing I'll say to you is, make sure you can actually state Newton's first, second, and third law, okay? If you look back at the past papers, you'll actually see uh, on, on a reasonably regular basis, you could actually ask to state the laws. Now, be careful because the question might actually be maybe say state Newton's say, second law, so you have to make sure you know which law is which. Now, if I could draw your attention back for one small little minute to okay, Newton's first law, what exactly is involved in Newton's first law? Well, basically, Newton's first law, really, what it actually is trying to do, is trying to explain the real meaning of the word force. Allow me just to comment on that for just one minute, okay? Um, when we just examine briefly, say, Newton's first law, what he's attempting to try and do is explain to us what exactly a force is. And put very, very simply, okay, what a force is, it's something that can actually, can say, cause motion, okay? So, for example, okay, if I have a situation, say, like this here, where I've got maybe, say, a particle and it's actually stationary, okay? Now, if I apply a force to it, okay, basically what's not going to happen is it's actually going to move. But if you actually look at the actual statement of the law, the way I actually have a word there for you, what we basically have is that a body continues in a state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line unless acted on by a resultant external force, okay? So really what it actually states is if something is actually stopped, it'll stay stopped. If something is already moving, for example, say, at a uniform speed, it will continue doing that. And then what will actually happen in this case here is if you apply the force, you'll either make the stopped object move or if it's moving, you'll make it speed up, slow down or change direction. OK, so basically, really what it's trying to do is explain to us exactly the meaning of that word there, force. Now, if you look at the actual notes, what I then do is I give you a bit of kind of background theory to all of this. I would suggest you take a few minutes to read it, OK? But the simple reality is that um, most of it is just that it's, it's background material. And basically, all you really need to know for the point of view of the actual exam is can you actually state Newton's first law, okay? Now, if you look at the very bottom of that page, there are two small little items I'd like to draw your attention to. One is a little reference there to friction, little definition of friction. Now, we don't do an awful lot at leave and cert physics level with regards to friction, but the little bit that we actually do is that we're actually asked to have a definition of friction. And can I suggest to you that you might actually just include that little definition on a list of things to kind of learn off by heart. However, there is one more item on the bottom of the page I do want to draw your attention to. Now, this item, okay, would be kind of say rather important. And um, it's the idea we actually have here of what we call momentum. Now, I'll just write that word on the board there for one small little minute. And with regards to um, momentum, what actually is it? Well, very, very simply, okay, if you have an object, okay, whose mass is m and it's moving along, say, at a velocity v, put simply, okay, its momentum, very simply, is the mass times the velocity. That's basically what the actual momentum actually is. Now, this is an idea that we need to know and use quite a lot. So it's very, very important. We're familiar, by the way, with the concept of momentum. The good thing is that actual formula is actually written in the maths table. You'll see it on page 51 of the maths table, so there's no major problem with regards to that, okay? Now, why do I say that momentum is important? Because of the laws, basically for us, the main one we are concerned with is Newton's second law, okay? Now, if you have your notes handy and you just turn over the page there, okay, onto what would be the page 21, you'll see an actual statement of Newton's second law. Now, this is, I suppose, in many, many ways for us, the, the main actual, should we say, piece of physics we have to have a look at here, okay? Now, what Newton's second law basically states is the following. Let's say you have an object whose mass is m and he's moving along there, minding his own business, say, at a, maybe, say, velocity of u. Now, something happens. His mass will remain the same but his velocity, say, changes to v. So basically, he could be going faster, he could be going slower, whatever, okay? Now, what Newton basically wants to tell us is this. 
If I multiply those two ideas together, if I write down mv, that's his momentum kind of when you look at him for the second time. When you multiply m by u, you get his momentum the first time you looked at him. And if you take those two numbers away from each other, okay, what you're basically getting now is the change in the two momentums. However, if you divide that by the time it takes to go from there to there, what you now have is what we call, kind of saying in physics, the rate of change of the momentums. And according to Newton, that there is proportional, okay, to the actual force. And that's the essence of Newton's second law. Force is proportional to the rate of change of momentum. So what I'm doing here is I'm just writing in algebra basically what's written in words at the very top of the page 21. Now, if you let me just do a little bit of kind of playing around with this, I get basically force is proportional to, I take the m outside the brackets, and I get v minus u over t, close the bracket. Now, if you look carefully, the v minus u over t is basically the official definition of acceleration. So what I now get is that force is proportional to mass by acceleration. Now, we have a little kind of a golden rule in physics. When we have a proportional, we're allowed to remove that, okay, and put in an equal sign. But there's one little problem. You can only change proportional to equal if, on one side of the equation, for example, on this side, we put in what is called a constant of proportionality. So we basically now say that f is equal to k times ma. Now, we do this quite a lot. For example, okay, in, uh, in light, when Schnell discovered, okay, that the sine of the angle I was proportional, say, to the sine of the angle R, he then changed that to say that the sine of the angle I is equal to the sine of the angle R. His proportional became an equal, and then he had to put in a constant. Now, he didn't go for K, he actually went for the letter uh, N, and he gave it a big fancy name. He decided to call it refractive index. Now, if I just remove that for one little second, okay, and I actually ask to think for one minute, what about, say, in electricity? Ohm discovered that voltage was proportional, okay, to current. And then very, very simply, we would change that to read voltage is equal to current, but again, I have to put in a constant. Now, he didn't go for a K, he went for the letter R. And of course, he gave R a name, he called it resistance. So we see this in Schnell's law, we see it in Ohm's law, and we're back here again, we see it here in Newton's law. But the one very strange thing, and this is unique to Newton, is in this case here, the K is given a rather unusual value. 1. The k actually has a value of 1. And the reason for that very, very simply is, okay, if you actually think about the units we use for measuring force, okay, what we actually do is we measure force in what's called a newton. Mass, of course, is the kilogram, and acceleration is the meter per second squared. And by agreement, we said if your acceleration was 1, and if your mass was, say, 1 kilogram, we agreed the force would be 1 newton. But in order for that equation to actually balance, and you pop in a k here, k can only have one value for that to work. k has to be 1. So it's really got to do, I suppose, really with the way the Newton was defined, okay? It's not for any great mathematical reason. It's more to do with the kind of a definition of a unit. And because the k is equal to 1, we don't bother writing 1. We simply say f equals ma. Now, what I've actually done there is I've kind of, I suppose, in many ways, I've possibly, I suppose you might say, derived a very, very important equation in physics, okay? This guy here. In fact, I could probably actually say that's probably one of the most important equations for us in Leaving Cert with regards to physics. Now, you see those steps I actually have done out there on the board? You'll see those exact same steps in your notes. And then um, just for the record, okay, they've actually asked you on four occasions in the past to actually to do that. They may not call it derived, they might say establish the equation f equals ma. But either way, what you see there on page 21, be able to state the law and literally be able to write out literally what I just did there. Okay, so be very careful with that. W one small thing just while we're talking about this equation for one small little minute, and it's just this. Further down the page, I just make a slight distinction between two little ideas. One is called mass, and the other very, very simply, by the way, would actually be known as weight. Now, I'm sure at this stage you're familiar with the fact that they're not the same word. They might mean the same word in conversation in English, but they're not the same in physics. And the link between those happens to be kind of say, the same as this here. And we, of course, say very simply, we say that weight is equal to mass by the acceleration due to gravity, okay? And then just for one small little minute, okay, there's no difference really between that equation and that equation because weight is the force of gravity, and mass is mass, and then the g here is the acceleration due to gravity. So in many, many ways, this idea here also falls out of Newton's law, okay? And as we know, mass is kilogram, 
the acceleration due to gravity is at meter per second squared, and of course, weight is the Newton, same as it was, by the way, back here. Okay? Now, I'll remove this out of the way for one minute because why? Well, you see, we have our famous F equals MA. Now, if you do me a little favor and you look there at the actual notes on the page 22, what you'll see is we have um, a mandatory experiment. And mainly what the experiment is doing is it's focusing on this equation and it's going to try and verify the connection between F and A, the force and the acceleration. Now, just for what it's worth, okay, that mandatory experiment that you see there, okay, has only featured once in the Leaving Cert back in the year 2010. Now it's 2020, okay? So could this guy possibly pop up in the 2020 exam? Absolutely yes. I mean, like, okay, you, you, you don't spend your whole life making predictions, but my point very simply is we haven't seen this for quite a while, so I think you'd be very wise to put a little bit of thought and effort maybe into looking at this particular, maybe, say, experiment. Now, what I'll actually do here very simply is this. I'll just set this whole thing up here for ourselves and we'll see exactly what we require. So I'm going to see if I can prove that force and acceleration are proportional to each other. Now there's only one little hiccup with this. If I want to prove that force and acceleration are proportional, it's absolutely vital, okay, at all stages that I maintain what's called a constant mass, okay? Now, how will I set this up? Well, I've got to figure out some way of going into a lab and having a way of measuring a, fo measuring a force, measuring an acceleration and proving if I make one bigger, I make the other guy bigger as well. So on a very simple level, how about this? There's a level table, okay, for one minute. Here I have what I would call maybe, say, a small little, say, trolley, which I'll put on the table. I'll have a piece of string like this passing over, say, a pulley wheel, and the actual string will just hang down by the side. Now, I'll have a facility that will allow me maybe hang weights over the edge. And then also I'm going to, back here, connect in a little piece of what I call paper tape or paper ribbon. Now, this paper tape, okay, as the trolley moves, the paper tape is going to move with the trolley. And I'm going to draw a very simple little device here, like a little box and a small little arrow. Now, it's not an art exam, so what I draw is not really the point. What's very important is the labels I give this, okay? Now, if you look there, I should say, at your notes for one small little second, okay? And just check. See the way I have this guy here is label number one. Label number one would very simply be the ticker tape timer. And label number two is simply pointing to the paper tape. So that's, that's pretty okay. Now, what you notice, okay, is, okay, over here I have maybe, say, a certain weight. So a very simple label for that guy, label six, would just be the word weight. And um, when you're labeling number five, the pulley, be very clever and call it a frictionless pulley, okay, or even a low friction pulley, okay? Now, you see the way label four is pointing to the piece of string? We would actually call that, say, non-elastic string, just, just being clever again. And of course, you notice I have certain weights here, I should say like this, say, on the trolley. So basically, the label three there would just be pointing to what I call trolley and weights. So most of that is pretty self-evident. But make sure, of course, when you draw the diagram, you label it, because the golden rule when correcting basically an exam is without the labels, you don't really get the marks. The marks go for the labels rather than the quality of the actual diagram. Mm -hmm.